No fear. Fear gonna cancel your faith, man. You already believe that I get, that's why you came and called me, right? Man, don't fear. Remember what he told the disciples? He said, man, don't be afraid. Look, the things that you're gonna be, the, the things that God is gonna be calling you to do, the things that you're gonna be stepping out on faith, you can't be scared. You cannot be scared. You can't be afraid. You have to just go for it. God said this here, man, look, I'm gonna order your steps. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Everything that you wanna do, the things that you wanna pursue, guys, you have to go for it. Don't be afraid. He says this here, only believe. Don't say what you see. Only believe. I don't care if things are looking down. I don't care if they said she's dead. Only believe. Don't be afraid. This man, these things, and what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hand? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, of Joseph, and of Judah, and of Simeon, uh, Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And verse 5 is the key. He says, And he could there do not mighty works, save that he laid hands upon a few sick folks and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages teaching. As I looked at this verse, and I'm, I'm just, you know, this is just a little quick little snippet of, of the scripture. This is just a little small uh, little piece. Thank you, Brother Carl. This is just a little small little piece, and I want us to look at this very little snippet of, of, of a bunch of events that, go, that went on throughout the scripture. And I came across something the other day, and I thought it was very interesting. I was at a, uh, at a seminar, and uh, the guy was talking about, man, when you, you look at information and you get ready to report something, he said there's the six, question of, six questions of journalism. Now, I knew what the questions were, but I just knew they didn't, never knew they had an official title. Can anybody tell me what is the six questions of journalism? Take your time, anybody. It doesn't matter if it's wrong. I ain't going to say nothing. I can't hear y'all. Say it out loud. When? Okay, somebody said when. Who? Okay. What? Wh how? Where? Why? Okay. Is that six or five? I went to public school. I don't know how many of y'all said. I heard, I heard when twice, and it was when, when. All we did is win, 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 no matter what, huh? All right. So, all right. So, the six questions is, who, what, where, why, how, and when. So I want us to be able to look at the scripture, right? And we're going to take a look at this scripture, this little snapshot, and I want us to answer all uh, six of those questions. So I know y'all are a very studious group. Y'all look like Bible scholars. So let's go and get to the first question. When we look at verses 1 through 6 in, uh, Mark, uh, yeah, 1 through 6 in Mark chapter 6, who, who is the who in this six verses? Let me just start at, let me start at verse 1. And when he went from thence, he came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. Huh. She got it right there. Go ahead on, give it up for Daphne. Okay, who else? Who else? Disciples, disciples. okay, Miss Darla. And who else? There's another group. The brothers? His brothers, his, brothers, his sisters, his Pharisees. Okay, well, let's, let me just read this here. And when the Sabbath day was come, and he began to teach in the synagogue, and many was here. So what that means is that, that the people was in the synagogue. So who is the who? Jesus. And the people in the synagogue. Boy, I tell you what, I can almost give an altar call because y'all are so smart. All right? So now we see the who. What's going on? The what. What is the what in these five, uh, six verses. Is it yeah, he's teaching, that's right. Jesus began to teach. And what else happened? Jesus is teaching. What's going on with the people in the synagogue? They start getting offended. Well, they, they, they are listening, right? And they're getting offended, okay? All right, what else was going on? They was questioning him, all right? So we covered the who, the what. Where is this thing going on at? Anybody? Okay, where is the synagogue located? 
let's see, let's, let's, let's just, uh, let's just see, uh, uh, can we, uh, let's see. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. It was, it was in Nazareth, it was in Nazareth, okay, it was in Nazareth. <laughs> Somebody say, Macomb, VJ. Back, Cecilia, uh, Brobridge, okay. So he was, in the, he was in Nazareth in the synagogue. Okay, why was he there? I know we kind of read it fast, but just take a guess. Kind of to, to teach, right. It was a custom for him on the Sabbath day that they would go in there, they would grab a scroll, and he would pull out a scroll, and he'd begin to read it, and then after he reads the scroll, he would go on and expound on it. Okay, so we covered the who, what, where, why. How was things, how was the atmosphere inside the synagogue? Hmm? It was a little bit tensed, right? Uh, how was the people there? Okay, right? It even says some of them was amazed at first. Like they, was, they, was, they were surprised, they were shocked. Not only were they amazed, but like y'all said, they were upset. How was Jesus doing all of this? We look at the end of it, Jesus was also amazed. And he also kind of was sorry because of their unbelief. Now, the last and final question of the, of the, of the six questions of, uh, of journalism, when did all this happen? On the Sabbath day. I heard him. <laughs> but yeah, it's it. On the Sabbath day. <laughs> Y'all don't know that was a Sabbath day show. It was the Sabbath. <laughs> all right, but thank you, everybody. Brother, Brother, thank you so much for them scriptures. <laughs> Man, it was not only on the Sabbath day, but it was after he had went all kind of other places, uh, and that we're going to look at that in just a second. So we covered the who, what, when, where, and why. So I want you just to, to, I want you to imagine with me that we are there uh, in Nazareth, man, at this particular time when Jesus is coming. Jesus is here. Uh, they're in the synagogue. What is a synagogue? Synagogue is nothing more but a temple or a church, kind of like we here today. Not only were they in the synagogue, but they were in Nazareth. Nazareth wasn't a big time synagogue place. Nazareth wasn't the, the place that was just popping for, for, you know, for the church folks or the believers kind of like it is in the end tonight. So the Nazareth, I mean, we could kind of see and feel and get a feel for what? For a synagogue. Now in that synagogue, that was Jesus. Now the Bible tells us two or three are gathered in my name that he is in the midst, so he is here, right? So not only was Jesus here, but as we kind of look around, this is this little uh, quote-unquote synagogue. Uh, who else they had? They had disciples. How many followers of Jesus do we have in here tonight? All right, that's good. So three of y'all, not only were there followers of Jesus in the synagogue, right, there was also some other people that was there, which is just like over here. They don't know why they're here. They're just here. Some of them came to hear a word from God. Some of them came because it was the Sabbath or it was the Tuesday or it was the Sunday. Some of them came because their parents drug them here. Some of them just came because, man, I, I could clap when he says something. I just... <laughs> So the thing is, they're in the synagogue. And I don't want us to, to think of them terms like they're so far-fetched that, that we can't really identify with them. Man, this is, this is pretty much the scene that was going on at the time. So let's go on and look with, with that in mind. Let's go on and look at verse 1 again. The Bible says, And when he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. Now, the first question when I begin to read and I'm kind of studying, I'm trying to just get a feel of things. The Bible says, and he went out from thence. Where in the world is thence? I don't know where thence is. I figured it was on the, between the corner of here and there. That was thence right there in the middle. <laughs> but <laughs> the word thence, he was in another part of the world, another part of the country. So I got a map that I want y'all to show y'all so y'all can see what is the fence that we're talking about. Okay, so when we look on this map right here, right? So he says this here. I just want to get back to the verse. He says this here on the verse. Uh, he says, and when he went, came out from thence and came into his own country, his disciples followed him. So what is the thence? This thence is this upper northern region of Israel, all right here, which is known as Galilee. Right. So Jesus, he be all of his ministry and all of his preaching and the majority of what he done. It was done in Galilee. Now, when you look at this map on Galilee, we can see some names that we might be familiar with. Capernaum. Right. Anybody been to Capernaum? 
right? All right. And we're, now, if we go all the way down here, we'll see Cana, but in the southern part of, uh, of, uh, of uh, 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 Galilee, we see Nazareth. My y'all came back can't see it on that side. That's Nazareth right there. Now, I want y'all to keep that in mind because as we go through the scriptures, we're going to be going and visiting a lot of these areas. Okay, so not only do we see Galilee itself, but this is going to be a famous area. Anybody know what this is? Somebody said swimming pool. No, that's the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> All right? And this little bitty blue line right there, can anybody tell me what that is? The Jordan. <laughs> The Jordan River. All right. So as we go on and go through the word, man, I'm going to be pulling out some of those spots because uh, uh, Jesus, uh, he was he was all over that place. So the question again, when, when I'm reading the scripture, I'm asking all kind of questions so that I can get just a real understanding of what's going on. So when I heard him that he was he was dense, I asked, what was Jesus doing in those towns in Galilee? In order for us to understand what is going on in chapter six, guess what we have to do? We have to go back. Take me back. Take me back. Boy, that, that, I tell you what, the word ain't right. That cut, that line in show sure is. Thank you, BB. Uh, Minister Bryant, that boy hooked me up today. Praise God. All right, so we have to go back, and I want to go back to Mark chapter 1. All right? Because when Jesus is here in the synagogue, some people believe or some uh, theologians believe that this is his, actually his second time that he was coming to uh, uh, Nazareth and begin to preach. I'm not really sure. To me, the scripture isn't clear because the first time that he went, you know, he read the scrolls and then he began to, to preach to him and kind of he done the same. He's done the exact same thing. So let's go on and back on to Mark chapter one. And we're just going to build up coming up to chapter six to see why was God's hand restricted on the lives of the so-called believers and why he couldn't do a major work there. Amen. Let's look at Mark chapter uh, one, verses nine. So. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth down the south, south side, right? Okay, that's not it, but y'all saw where the map was, the southern part. And Jesus came, uh, and it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Gal Galilee and was baptized of John in the Jordan River. All right? Now, once Jesus is baptized in the Jordan, everything changed. Right? Everything going to change. This right here is going to mark the start pretty much of Jesus' ministry and doing all the stuff that he was done. All before he was just a carpenter boy building tables and chairs and doing all kind of stuff, probably working with rocks and all that stuff because, you know, I don't know how prevalent wood was in, in the way I see this Israel because I, all I see is a bunch of stones and all that stuff. But the thing is that Jesus, he, he is almost like he's, he's transitioning from, from being just a, a young boy or a young man to being to what his, 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 his reasoning for coming uh, to the earth. So the Bible says that he, he was baptized by John. Now, everybody know who John was. That was his little cousin, right? Y'all know that was his little cousin. Now, y'all know Jesus had a little cousin. That was him. Just, that, was, that was Big John. Big John went on and took him to the river. He got baptized in the Jordan. So the first thing we see here is that John baptized Jesus. All right? Let's keep on going. The minute John, uh, the minute that Jesus came up out of the water, we know that the Bible says that, that the Spirit of the, the Holy Spirit descended on the Jesus in the form of a dove, and a voice was heard audibly to all the people that were there. He said, this is my son, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Now remember, this is going up in the northern part of Galilee where everybody is hearing this voice coming out of nowhere. This is my beloved son in whom I am well. What y'all would do if we have a baptism outside and we go to baptize somebody and all of a sudden you hear a voice or you see a bird come down? Uh, these Christian, oh, y'all better kill that, call somebody, get extra. Y'all better, got the, y'all heard the devil talking? <laughs> hey, I read a uh, meme the other day. They said, man, the believers today, if David had to go and fight Goliath, they would have tell him, boy, don't go play with Goliath, but you better pray for him. <laughs> oh, that's not funny, y'all. If you think about that. They're saying that the believers today don't have enough faith to do the things that David did, and David didn't even think he was doing nothing special. But back to, to Jesus. So he goes into the water, he gets baptized, and he comes up. 
And God proclaims to the, everyone that was around that this is my son who I'm, who I'm very, very pleased of. And the Bible says in verse 13 of that very same chapter, and when there, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days. So immediately after he gets baptized, guess what happened? He goes, the spirit, the Bible says that the spirit drives him into the wilderness to be tempted. Now over there, we know that he's going to be tempted in every form that could be tempted by man. So I don't want you ever to think that, man, nobody knows what I'm going through. Jesus don't know what I went through. Man, I got to do it, deal with this. I got to deal with that. Nah, Jesus was tempted in every form. Why? Yes, he was 100% God, but why did he have to be tempted? Because to prove to us and be that example to us that no matter what goes on in our lives, guess what? We can make it through. Amen. Now, if you think about, okay, yeah, remember y'all, y'all, just one clap and let's keep moving. That's what I'm talking about. So, I want you to remember, remember when, when he was out there, right? And, and the Bible says that 40 days and 40 nights, he didn't drink anything, he didn't eat anything. Man, I tried that one time, and for 40 minutes, I was just unbearable. Like, I, I was aggravated, I was tensed up, you know? He said, man, how long you been fasting? Oh, it's been at least about 20 minutes, 20, 30 minutes, man. And, uh, but Jesus was out there fasting. And the devil saw that Jesus was hungry, right? So he picked up a stone and he, he came to, to Jesus and he told Jesus, he says, man, I know you're hungry. Why don't you take the stone and turn it into bread? Now, it was anything wrong with Jesus turning that stone to bread? No, he was hungry. But the problem is we have to make sure we have to watch to see where is that, that, that thing coming from? Where is that, that so-called blessing coming from? All blessings, all good things not of God, right? Not all good things are godly. So he told the devil, he says, man shall not live by what? But by every that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Now, I want us to, to keep that in mind because a lot of times we can quote these verses, we can quote these scriptures, but when, when, it, when, it, when the rubber meets the road and we're faced with something, Man, we're not worried about no word. I don't want to hear the word, the word, the word. If someone's coming to call it like I see it. But that's not what Jesus did. He says, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan and with the wild beasts. And the angels ministered unto him. Now, again, we know the story. Not only did he turn the, 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 he, Jesus, the, the devil tried to tempt him to turn the bread into stone. He, he brought him to the highest uh, temple and told him, he, I mean, the uh, highest point of the, the area. And he says, man, look around. All the, all the world could be yours. All you got to do is bow down to me. Right? He told Jesus, man, jump off the building. And the angel's going to lift you up. And that was the word. But Jesus said, man, I'm not going to tempt the Lord thy God. Right after that, after he had went through this ordeal, the Bible says this here. It says, and the angels ministered to him. That stood out to me. Why did it stood out to me? Because I really believe that there's angels or spirits assigned to us, and, and they're, they're there to minister unto us. And that's the very thing that happened with Jesus. Man, he was going through. Yes, they probably brought him some Popeyes, or maybe they brought him something from Gidro. Well, no, it wasn't Gidro's, but they brought him some food, and they ministered to him, right? They took care of every single thing that he needed, and that's the same thing with us. Too many times we try to carry everything on our own, and God is saying, man, I have sent you some help. I got you the, 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 the Holy Spirit. I did. He's going to be your confidant. He's going to be there with you. But not only that, I have spirits assigned to you and to the heirs of salvation. Some of y'all don't believe, so let's go to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 14. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 14, and the word says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? What does that mean? Man, you got some help, man. Call on your help. You ain't got to go through this thing by yourself. You ain't got to be doing it always yourself. You have some help. Psalms 34, verse 7, what is it says? The angel of the Lord is encamped around about those that fear him, and he will deliver them. And I've been quoting the scripture wrong for a long time. I always was saying that the angels of the Lord is encamped around about those. It says one angel. Amen. <laughs> one angel. Y'all know what happened to Seneca Rare at that time when he came run up against us? 165,000 men dead by one angel. But I just want to let you know that when I, when, it, when I look at this verse, man, it, it just comes alive to me. The other night, man, uh, my wife and my daughters, they was out of town. It was, in, uh, it was in Dallas, in Fort Worth area. And uh, she was out there for a conference and stuff. But you mind me telling your business? It's already too late. I'm already up there. <laughs> so y'all want to hear Misha business? They tell me her business. Look down, look down. They're the main one. Want to hear the business. Oh, 
she want to hear the tea. <laughs> the tea. Okay, so look. So, man, they was out there in, in Fort Worth, man, and uh, she was out there to, to go to a convention or whatever. But what happened was they saw this, this big fair, this livestock show going on. So, man, they had some time on their hands. So they was going to go out there, you know, kind of kill some time. So, man, she's going live, and, boy, she's showing all kinds of stuff. And I'm trying to drive and watch, and I just pray that the angel of the Lord should camp around about me because I really don't want to be driving and looking at my cell phone. But I did that, you know, because I wanted to be a supportive husband. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you just got to be supportive. That's it. Praise, appreciate it. So while she was there, man, they enjoyed everything. They did their thing. Now, she leaves there, and she goes to the event that she went to Dallas for, and she texts me, and she said, Phil, man, I, I lost the... Uh, the credit cards, three credit cards at the fair. So I'm like, baby, it's going to be all right. I said, you didn't lose them. So I can tell in the tone of the text that she was adamant by, look, boy, I lost the cards, and one of them was yours. I said, one of them was mine. So I begin to pray. I begin to uh, intercede. I begin to win. <laughs> okay, no, no, no. <laughs> Let me tell y'all what I did. I say, Misha, I text. I say, look, you didn't lose the cards. You misplaced them. She told me, she said, Phil, I ain't checked everywhere for them cars. Them cars are not there. Immediately, I said, angel assigned to me, go get them cars for my wife and bring them to her now. And then he told me, boy, first of all, don't tell me now. I'm going to get there when I want. <laughs> you know? So you got to watch yourself. Don't, don't, you know, just watch yourself. Don't get too jazzy with, the, with your help. You know what I'm saying? So my mom called and... Uh, she, uh, she was calling me with a prayer request to, to put on a prayer line. So I just told her, I said, Mom, I said, I just finished praying, man, that God, uh, the angel of the Lord would go get Misha lost the credit cards while she was in Dallas. And uh, so, you know, my mom, she began to pray. And then she like the old song, I had a praying grandmother, even though that's my mama. But this is the thing. She began to pray, and she did the very same thing. So I, I text Misha. I said, look, you want me to cut my card off? Because I, <laughs> I can cut mine off of my cell phone. But... You know, I didn't want to see where her faith was. But anyway, she called me. She said, look, don't worry about it. Let me, let me just wait till I get out, and, you know, we'll see what happens. So she, she texts me, or she calls me. She says, Phil, when I walk back to the car, all three of the credit cards are sitting in the middle of the driver's seat. She says, somebody could have bust the window and stole the cars. And I'm saying to myself, girl, how are they going to do it when it was in the angel hand? If you understand, when Jesus was inside of the, the, the wilderness, he was going through. He was going through everything that we was going to be facing. But the Bible says that the angels ministered to him. Why are we not allowing our angels to minister to us? Not only that, why we, we look and we continue. And guys, I, I'm doing all this because I'm leading somewhere. I'm going somewhere because I want us to get to chapter 6. Because we're going to see why in the world would God not be able to do major works and major deals in his own hometown when he's doing things all around and every, all the other parts of Galilee. So we know what, what's another big thing that happened in Galilee uh, or, 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 or Jesus uh, early on in his ministry? Uh, if we jump down to verse uh, 16... He called his disciples. Mark chapter 1, verses 16, he says, Now as he walked by the sea of Galilee, remember he had already been baptized. Not, not only did he baptize, he'd been in the wilderness for 40 days. Now I believe, and I, I just want to think that, uh, that the wilderness itself was somewhere in that, that general area where the Jordan River cut, touches the uh, Sea of Galilee. The Bible says, Now as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, Casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Now imagine this here. These brothers are hard at work on their job, doing their thing. And this guy they don't even know calls him. He said, Say the word. Both of y'all, you and your brother. Now he didn't see he didn't say it like that. <laughs> but he just called them. He says, Man, I know you're fishers, but I'm gonna make you fishers of men. And he told them to come. And we jump down to verse 19, and we understand, we're we, we, we going to get to 19, but guess what? Them boys left, and they came. Amen. What y'all do if y'all on your job? And somebody pack them and say, hey, man, I want you to come follow me. I'm going to make you fishes of men. Mm, please. Mm, please. Y'all know. Would y'all go? Huh? <laughs> come on, you going fishing? 
All right, let's look at verse 19. And when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship, mending their nets. And straightway he called them. Say, little word, you and your brother, I need y'all to come with me. And straightway he called them. And guess what they done? And they left their father, Zebedee, in the ship. Something was revealed to me right here. Not only did these brothers have faith, not only did them brothers believe in, in who was calling them, I saw something else that I didn't see in the scriptures before, and I really think that God is, is turning us around. He's getting us to set up to, to do some major works for him. He's, I think he's getting ready to uh, call some of us to, to go out on the mission field, he's getting us ready to call some of us to go out and be witnesses to him. But if you look close at the scripture, he says, and straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ships, in the ship with the hired servants, and went after them. You say, what's the big deal? Do our limited mind and our limited uh, thinking, we always look at this with some poor fishermen. But when I look at this, I see not only did they have ships that they were working, but they was able to go and do the works of God without worrying about coming back. Man, I, I can't go, Lord. I, I, got to, I got to get to work tomorrow. Now, nah, they left their company, the largest fishing enterprise on the Sea of Galilee. They both ran these twin big companies, and they left their father with who? With the hired. Listen, look at that. They left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants. You know why them boys could have just leave and go do what they had to do? Why? Because they were some entrepreneurs. Because they was working their own thing. They had companies. They had people in place. Too many of us, man, we too scared to step out and open that business. But today, guys, I want to stir your faith today. How was Jesus able to go out and do all the things that he had? And man, they ain't never had no jobs. I never saw one person in the Bible punch a clock. Not one. But I'm looking at these boys. They called him. He says, Jesus says, I'm going to make you fish as a man. We're going to go out and preach the gospel. Man, how long are we going to be going? Oh, about two or three months. Oh, man, it's all good. How much y'all need? They left their daddy in the boat. Oh, in the, now, look, we always say boat. That was a ship, man. Not only was it a ship, but if you look a little bit further down, and I don't have the scripture, it says that the big ship left, and there were some smaller ships all around. So when I look at that, I begin to picture these Hebrews with a fleet of ships, fishing boats, going down to the Sea of Galilee. Man, they doing their thing, and guess what? They coming and doing commerce with all of the whole Galilee. No, well, you better get your fish from them Zebedee bars. Well, Zebedee got the best fish sticks. Well, no, not fish. I don't even know what part of the fish has the sticks. But this is the thing. Them boys had their own companies. They were running their own business. So I don't know who it is that maybe you've been thinking about it. You've been uh, saying, man, God, I, I want to do it. I want to do it. I want And you're looking for a sign. Here's your sign. Go it on and do it. Amen? All right. They didn't know who he was, but they believed in him. Let's keep on going. Another thing that happened with Jesus is this thing. And then, like I said, we're building up. Let's go to Matthew, uh, Mark chapter uh, 1. We'll come on down to verse 22. And the Bible says, uh, and they were astounded at him and his doctrine. For he taught them as some that had authority, not as the scribes. So now we see Jesus in Capernaum. He's in a, one of the synagogues. Now, just to let you know that uh, Capernaum, well, that's what one of the major synagogues was. That everybody, that was like one of the mega churches at the time. That was one of the, the big, big deals. This thing right here, everybody was over there. And the scribes begin to preach and to teach and they do their thing. But, but it was, something was different when Jesus grabbed the scrolls and began uh, to teach. And he says, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, not as the scribes. As, they, as there was in their synagogues a man with an unclean spirit. Now, this right here I want us to see because a lot of times we don't want to look at that and say, oh, man, you know, somebody come there and just start foaming at the mob and doing all kinds of stuff. Man, we running and taking off. But now, at this place, in the synagogue, this was a, there was a man there with an unclean spirit. He was possessed with a devil. Can people be possessed with devils inside the church? Hmm? All right. All right. Again, 
I want to stir your faith up tonight. I want you to be able to believe in the power of the Most High God that no matter what you face or no matter what comes against you, you're going to be able to stand and you're going to be able to do the thing that God has called you to do. So, man, they're walking in there, and they're, uh, like I said, saying, uh, uh, and he had an unclean, uh, and there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Now, at this point, he's in the synagogue. This has never happened before. This man begins to, to act out. The spirit that's inside of him begins to act out when he sees Jesus. Now, this is the thing. Remember, in Nazareth, he could do nothing major there. He could not do anything major in Nazareth, but yet when he walks into the synagogue in Capernaum, what happens? The demons begin to shake. They're acting all up. They're wilding out. Why? Because they understand the power that is inside this man. But just remember, in Nazareth, it wasn't, being, it wasn't happening. He says, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? And I know thee and who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him and said, boy, shut up, shut your mouth. <laughs> no, he didn't say it. He said, hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out and immediately his fame spread abroad throughout the region round about Galilee. Now, right now, man, it's, it's, it's starting to build up. Everything is starting to really to build up. Remember, Jesus was baptized. Then after he got baptized, he went to the wilderness. Next thing you know, he called his disciples. Man, look, now he's going into places. The demons are recognizing who he is. The power of the Most High God is on him. Yes, he is 100% God, but he's still 100% man. And he's walking up in there. Now the fame began to spread. Man, Jesus is going viral. Right? If they had a TikTok or, or uh, Facebook or something, Jesus got 100,000 views just today. Just because that demon was talking and Jesus cast him out. What else happened in there? Not only did he cast out devils, if you go further down in chapter, um, verse 31, the Bible says, and it came to pass, and it came, and they came and took her by the hand. Now, right now, they're in Simon Peter's, his mama, uh, his mother-in-law is sick. She's running a real bad fever. So all the disciples are there, man, and Jesus is, is gone in there. Now, right now, man, Jesus is healing people. He's, he's doing all kind of miracles and all kind of things. And I think this is really was, was a key uh, point for the disciples to see. Because, man, it's one thing for Jesus to be able to do them, but, man, do, do they have that very same power? And Jesus wanted to show them, look, man, if you believe, nothing is impossible. So, man, they go, walks in there, they walk into uh, Simon Peter's house, and verse 31 says, And it came, and he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. Guess what? The whole house believed. The whole house believed because he was able to get rid of that fever. Not only did she he get rid of the fever, but the Bible says that he ministered, she ministered to them. So now, guess what? She was back to doing whatever she was doing before. She went, baby, you want some Kool-Aid with that, with that rice and beans? You, 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 let me clean up. Uh, let me, oh, look, come sit down right here. Let me let you wash your feet. She ministered to him, right? Now, we keep on going. What is going on with Jesus, man? Now you got not only uh, the, the people all around is hearing about Jesus, not only the, 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 the whole Galilee northern region is getting excited. We see here the whole house believed because uh, Peter's uh, mother-in-law was healed. Let's go on. with one, Some other things happened in uh, verse 40. Jesus heals the leper. The Bible says, and there came a leper to him, beseeching him. And kneeling down to him. Now, when it says that there came a leper, man, this is here is already crazy. Because a leper, first of all, they, they got to live outside the city. They can't even be around everybody else. Now, the thing is, with leprosy, you can't come in within a certain distance of the people. But if you do happen to be coming near people, you have to let them know, man, by a, uh, you have to let them know that you are a leper. And how do they let them know? They begin to yell out, unclean, unclean, unclean. But this boy here has begun to hear what is going on in Galilee. He's beginning to hear a word about this man that's possessing the powers, that has supernatural powers, that can do the very things that nobody else can do. So what happens to the leper? And, it came, and, and there came a leper to him. He didn't even wait for Jesus to get to him. He went to Jesus. 
All right? And it says, beseeching him. What does that word beseech mean? He's begging and he's telling Jesus, listen, I just need to get, I, I, I got to spend some time. I got to spend a moment with you because I know you are the one. If anybody could heal me, I know you can. I believe deep down in my heart that you can bring change in my life and upon my body. Jesus, listen. And I can tell his disciples, it's like, whoa, now look, fever is one thing, but that boy got pus and all kind of stuff coming all off his body. Man, that's something totally different. But the leper began to beg and kneel down to him and saying unto him, I really believe that you can heal me. I know that you can heal me. I know that you possess all power. I am totally convinced that I could be made whole. If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. He says, man, Jesus, look, I got the faith to believe. I already got it. It's up to you now. What, what, what are you going to do? How many times we go up to Jesus and let Jesus know, look, man, I am totally convinced. I have faith. I am confident in who you are and your abilities. It's all up to you. A lot of times the opposite is different. Because Jesus is saying, man, I got everything for you. I'm there for you. Anything you need, I got it. But so many times he can't do the greater works because of our unbelief. So this leper is on his hands and knees and he's talking to Jesus. And the Bible says in verse 41, and Jesus moved with compassion. Jesus felt him. I don't want you to ever think that, man, you're going to be crying or you're going to go through something, man, and, and Jesus is not, not, not going to feel you. The very things that concerns you, it concerns your heavenly father, right? And Jesus moved with compassion, put for his hand. Now, just remember, man, you don't touch nobody that got leprosy. You know, you man, you don't touch him, but... Jesus says, man, I'm not worrying about no leprosy. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him and said unto him, I will be thou clean. That's all he said. Jesus was moved by the beseeching of the man and the faith of the man. He says, I will. 42 says, and as soon as... As he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. And he straightway charged the man. Now listen to what Jesus is going to tell him. He said, now look. Listen, I want you to listen close. He's like, okay, yes, God. I'm. Jesus said, boy, focus. I need you to focus now. Listen. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, yes, I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do. Okay? Jesus said, listen. And he straightly charged him. And forthwith sent him away and said unto him, listen to what he said. See thou say nothing to any man. I want you to be healed. Yes. Don't say nothing. And, and, and the leper guy, you just, yes, okay. Yes, no. I mean, yes. See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way and show thyself to who? To the priest. And offer thy cleansing, okay? He said, okay, now that you've been healed, go ahead and offer. All right? I know we've been talking about tithes and offering and bringing our gifts before God. They were doing it even back then. They went. He, Jesus told him, man, go, uh, go to the priest and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for the testimony of them. Now, this brother was so excited. He did exactly what Jesus said to do. No, he did not. But verse 45 says, but he went out and began to publish it much to a blaze abroad the matter. That boy didn't almost had, there's almost like a wave of revival, a wave uh, uh, just was coming through because he was so excited. I don't even know if the boy even got to the priest. He's like, man, look at, <laughs> look at me. He, just hoping that he, you know, maintained his composure. He didn't want people to see all of his skin. You know, he just look, just, just showed your arm, but better show you, show your arm in the leg. That's all you need to show. That boy was excited. Again, <laughs> he began to publish it much, and the blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was without, but was without in a desert place. And they came from every quarter of the earth. And Jesus is on, is on and popping right now. The people are so excited. The people are coming from everywhere. Jesus couldn't go nowhere without being recognized because of the miracles and the power that he was doing. This leopard man believed in God. He, he was so excited. He knew that if he could just get to Jesus, Jesus was going to heal him. But what was going on in Nazareth? Jesus couldn't do no major works in Nazareth. He said, because of the unbelief. 
Let's keep on going. What else happened? Jesus heals a paralyzed man. All right, let's go to Mark chapter 2. Now, we're building up to, to, to chapter 6, and we're going to get to it. But I want to stir you up today. I want you to, to, to start thinking about, man, where am I at in my life? Where, what is the things that I've been maybe tying God's hand with? Why isn't God moving in my life like he should? Or why isn't that, that the major works are not happening with me? Is it something I'm doing, or is it something I'm saying? We don't want to be like those in the synagogue in Nazareth. Jesus heals a paralyzed man. Uh, Mark chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born by four. Now we know this story, and this is a story of the paralyzed man, and he had four buddies. His four partners, man, he, he couldn't walk. All he can do was lay there on his little mat. So, man, they would each grab a corner, or they would each grab a part of it, and they would carry him wherever he had to go, right? And I got to say to the, about the paralyzed man that he had some great people around him. Because if you think about it, if they didn't move him or bring him where he needed to go, he couldn't move at all. He just would lay there. So those brothers, those four guys, and they begin to hear about the fame of this man called Jesus. Things begin to stir up with him, and one of them had came up with an idea. He said, man, I hear Jesus is going to be preaching and teaching here in the city. Man, how about we bring uh, Buford? I don't know his name. Buford, Raul, whatever his name. Why don't we bring him to Jesus? And the boy said, man, I just know if we get out there, man, Raul will be made whole. So you look at Raul, you believe in Raul. Mm -hmm. yes, Y'all wrong for that. <laughs> Y'all wrong for that. The man was paralyzed. They say he couldn't talk. I don't know if he could talk or not, but the thing was this here. So he was born by four. And when they could not come nigh unto, the, unto him because of the press. <laughs> okay, I got to read this slow. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, everybody know what the press is? All these people are there in the building. They tight, tight, tight up in there. Y'all know how you, well, it was tight up in there. They, just, they couldn't even move like they wanted to. You know, they just, the music, the music going. It was tight up in there. And they come to the front door. They can't even bring him in. Why? Because there's so many people there. So they had a bright idea. They said, man, let's bring him to the roof. Let's bring him to the roof of this, this house. Now, this is the thing. What kind of feet you got? <laughs> what is the building? They, they don't say if a synagogue, I don't know if it was at somebody's house, or what, who, whose homeowner's insurance is going to pay for them about to rip the top of these people's house off? <laughs> Help us, Lord. Okay. And when they could not come nigh unto, the, uh, unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. I want you to imagine that, man, Jesus is, is beginning to share the gospel. He's preaching to them the kingdom of, the kingdom of heaven is at, <laughs> the kingdom of heaven is at hand, you know, and he's trying to preach, and you got ceiling tile, you got dust, you got insulation, all this stuff is falling, all the people that's in right, right around there, they could see that stuff. And Jesus, <laughs> oh boy, oh boy, we really need chill out. And they could not come nigh unto him because of the press. They uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of palsy lay. How many of your friends would do that for you? If you were sick and you couldn't move around, how many of your friends would do all of that to bring you to Jesus? Or how many of your friends would say, man, just chill out, man, look, that's, it is what it is. We need to take inventory of the people that we're around or the people that we're hanging with, the ones that we're spending our time with. Are they leading us closer to God? Are they leading us closer to a relationship with Jesus? Or are they pulling us far away? These boys right here getting ready to change this boy's life forever. Why? Because they would not stop and not allow any obstacle to stop them from getting their friend to Jesus. They tore the roof open. The Bible says in verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he, he, he saw their faith, he saw their belief, he saw how strong it was. Where is your faith today? 
Where is your faith? Do you believe enough that if something would go down, if this place is packed up, would y'all go bust through that, that roof? Don't worry about it. We call Simon's. Uh, Simon's going to go patch that thing up, get it fixed up. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto him, unto the sick of palsy, he said, Son, thy sins are forgiven thee. He saw the friend's faith. How many of you know that your faith could actually move and be a blessing to somebody else? Sometimes, man, the, the, the person that's there or your friend might not have enough faith, but if enough of y'all lock hands and pray, the Bible says if two or three uh, should touch and agree, they can have what they will. They can ask whatever they will. These boys right here locked in their faith, dropped that man in front of Jesus, and Jesus said this here, when Jesus saw their faith, not the faith of the palsy, he said unto the sick of palsy, son, thy sins be forgiven. And guess what? Everybody believed. They were believing but for some reason in Nazareth, Jesus said he couldn't do any, any major works there. Let's keep on going. Jesus heals a man with a withered hand. We look in Mark chapter 3, verses 5. And when he had looked around about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their heart. Now, this is the thing. He was in one of the major synagogues again. The religious leaders of the day was already there. They was watching Jesus. They got sick. So they was getting so sick and tired of everybody talking about Jesus. You heard of Jesus? You heard of Jesus? You heard of Jesus? Man, Jesus here. Jesus that Jesus. So they begin to watch Jesus to see, man, we got to trap him. We got to stop him from doing what he's doing. So on that Sabbath day, Jesus is inside the synagogue, right? And they got a man over there, and his hand is withered. His hand is withered. So he, they want to see, man, what Jesus is going to do. I dare Jesus to go it on and go against the laws of uh, 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 our laws and go it on to heal somebody on the Sabbath. Let's see what happened. And when he looked around about them, this Jesus, he looked about them with anger. And you know what happened when Jesus get that righteous indignation? He about to tear something up up in there. Y'all remember when Jesus boys were selling all kind of stuff in the temple? Jesus came in there, flipped up tables, took a belt, started whipping everybody. Y'all be like, no, Jesus loves everyone. Praise God. Jesus, hallelujah. He would never hurt a fly. Boy, Jesus was, boy, Jesus was ticked off right here. He says, and, and, and being grieved for the hardness of their heart, he said unto the man, stretch forth thy hand. Now, this, at this point right here, almost inside that room, you could almost sense that all the air every time even stopped because Jesus made a command. Now, this man has been coming to the synagogue. Right? This man has been coming, and he knows all the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin. He knows all of them. He don't really know Jesus like that. He just heard about him. Now, he has to make a decision. Because Jesus told him, stretch forth thy hand. Now, the man could come up there and say, man, you know, nah, nah, you know I'm, I'm, I'm good, bro. You know, because he don't know. Right? He could do that. Or... <laughs> Come on, y'all. We're we talking about the faith part. I want y'all to, the man hand was with it. Or he could act out of obedience to God. And he can act out of faith and stretch forth his hand. Now, what is going through his mind? Like, like what, what do you think he, he, the pressure he's dealing with? Because, yes, Jesus is teaching, but now every eye inside of the whole church is looking at the man with the withered hand. Boy, what you going to do? Let's see what's gonna happen here. And boy, look, look, they probably text him, oh boy, they, boy Jesus told that man to stretch his hand out. Y'all know little Pookie the ball with the short hand. I'm talking about Jesus told him. And the Bible says this here. Out of faith, because he believed in who he was dealing with, he believed who was in front of him. He stretched forth, he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. This act of faith, again, the crowd went crazy up in there. They're like, boy, what the world? And I'm looking at the little man, boy, he keep doing all this right here, and he's doing, and I'm like, bro, what are you, praise God, yes, but I'm doing, he wanted to show everybody his hand was working. And I can think about the time, man, when my hand 
This very rich right here, and I know a lot of y'all told, told, heard the story already, and I'm going to just rush through it. But again, I want to stir your faith up. I don't want you to be living life every single, all day long, every day, just like, oh, man, I just, it is what it is. Whatever happens, happens. Nah, we have to elevate our thinking. We have to elevate our thought, understand who we are, what power that we possess through Jesus Christ. All right? I can definitely identify with the, with the withered hand deal. Uh, for those of you who don't know, man, uh, when I was younger, I wrecked my motorcycle. I was uh, got into it with a guy in Lafayette, and I was... Plan on coming home, we was going to ride motorcycles. And if y'all know a street in Opelousas it's called Crestwell Lane, is the, you know, that's the busiest street in Opelousas. That's probably one of the, anyway, it's the busiest street in Opelousas. It was a Friday night. I'm coming down the street and I'm going probably about 45, maybe 50 miles an hour on my motorcycle. And this little guy, 16 year old, he just turned right in front of me because he was trying to get to the movies because him and his girlfriend was late to the movies. And when I saw the truck, I mean the car, all I could say was, oh no, and I'm still hitting the gas on the bike. And lo and behold, man, the, the, the bike threw me like 20 something feet. And I guess when I was coming down, because I, I remember I said, I had enough time to say, boy, it's quiet out here. And I'm just moving through the air. And then I started saying, I believe I can fly. Woo. Then I hit the ground, I broke all the bones in my wrist. So I'm sitting there with this wrist just kind of hanging over because it was all completely crushed. Long story short, man, we get to the hospital. Uh, the man, they didn't want to see me because I didn't have insurance. So they was like, man, uh, look, man, send him to Baton Rouge to Earl K. Long and they call Earl K. Long, Earl K. Long and had none. They said, man, send him to New Orleans. The doctor didn't even want to come out and see me. But I had a praying grandmother. My mama came over there. She said, Phil, don't believe nothing they said because they already told me that they was going to cut my hand off. Now, I wasn't even married yet. How I was going to holler at me? She you know what I'm saying? I couldn't. So long story short, man, the doctor went in there and he finally come and my mama prayed. The pastor came and they prayed and I was repenting for everything. I'm telling y'all right now, Lord, forgive me for wetting them pecans before I sold them. Lord, forgive me for putting sand in them cans before I crushed them. Father, forgive me for shooting them squirrels in the city limits. Lord, I was repenting for everything. And guess what happened, y'all? I go, <laughs> go into surgery, I come out of surgery, lo and behold, the doctor and my mom is fussing, and they're like, man, he's blessed, no, he's lucky, he's blessed, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Long story short, the doctor said he had never seen this before, he stuck the first pin in, and all my bones popped back in place. You gotta clap for Jesus. So I can understand that he stretched his hand, and his hand was restored. Another one, we look in uh, Mark chapter 4, verses 38, Jesus calms the sea, and he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. Now just remember, if that was a little small boat, how can he be down low somewhere on, on a pillow? Who keeps pillows in, their little, in a little boat? But John, you ever saw a pillow in a pillow? No, uh-uh, it don't happen. This was a ship. The disciples wasn't no little poor uh, fishermen. These boys had a major uh, company, a major fishing operation. But the Bible says that Jesus was asleep on a pillow. And they awakened him and say unto him, Master, carest not thou if we perish? What? We were Jesus. The one that just stretched forth the, the withered hand. The one that just, uh, one of them disciples, that was probably Peter, one of them boys. But you just saw your wife got healed of fever. I mean, your mother-in-law. You saw him cast out the devils, and you up here worrying about a storm that just arose up, and you're going to tell Jesus, doest thou care that thou, that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind, and he said unto the sea, peace, be still. And all of a sudden, man, them boys are just tossing and waving. They were, I just saw surfing and what? They were something and surfing. You remember what them boys were doing in Atlanta? They, that was, that's how the ship was gone. But at that very moment, everything got still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, now listen to what Jesus' response to them was. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? Peter, James, John, Andrew, y'all been with me already, man. Y'all see everything that I've done. 
Y'all see the power that is within me. Why is it that you couldn't let me go to sleep? And I've been healing sick. I've been running all the way from Capernaum on this side to see, feeding 5,000. I'm doing all this stuff. Why couldn't you say, peace, be still? What's the first thing happen? They got scared. And a lot of times that's what happened to us. We face with some situations or we face with something that, that might seem so dire or something that, that we just can't figure out. And the first thing happens, we get scared. Let the bill come and ain't got the right amount of money in the checking account. Man, we get scared. Let them go to charge us too much on our light bill and we didn't talk to them on the phone for three, four days, five, six days at a time. <laughs> and <laughs> what do we do? We get fearful. Let them say they found a spot in our bodies. We get fearful. But Jesus is telling them, he says, why are you fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And I can just think, I know Jesus knows all what I'm saying. I bet he's saying, man, I just don't want them boys to get like them down in Nazareth. I need them to main faith. I need them to keep, uh, keep their, their belief in me, keep it strong. Let's keep on going. Mark chapter 5, verses 25, the woman with the issue of blood. We're going to cover her right quick. Now, this situation right here, this is like a two, uh, two-part situation because at the time in the synagogue, one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus, uh, Jairus or whatever his name was, he came to Jesus and he said, man, Jesus, great master. He says, man, my daughter is sick. And boy, immediately everybody in the synagogue, hmm? Oh, because you know how Jesus don't like them, the scribes and the Pharisees and all that. Them, he don't like the religious leaders. But all the religious leaders were not the same. All of them were not the ones that, that didn't want Jesus to do his thing. Some of them believed and they had faith, and Jairus was one of them. So he comes up to Jesus and says, great master, listen, my, my, my daughter is sick. Can you please just come and heal her? And all, all, I'm telling y'all, at, at, in an instant, everybody that was in that synagogue turned their head, and they wanted to see what Jesus said. And Jesus said, man, let's go. Let's go heal her daughter. Everybody gets up and they following Jesus and not he just going after Jesus again. You got a multitude. Look, all of a bunch of people that want to see, man, what's going to happen next? Yeah, I know he healed the hand, but can he really heal Jairus' daughter? So they go. It was a multitude. I don't know if it was 20, 30, 40, 50. It could have been 100. It could have been 150. But while they was on the way to heal Jairus' daughter, the Bible says in uh, verse 25 of chapter 5, there was a certain woman which had an issue of blood, 12 years. This woman has been going through for a very long time and had suffered many things and many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better, but rather it grew worse. I want you to picture the sister. That whatever her infirmity was, it, it, it couldn't get right. She had some, cow, uh, some type of issue with the blood, that the blood was always leaking out because you're going to see that it says that the fountain stopped. So that means that wherever she went, there was some type of drip that was falling on. Imagine the, the stench that was coming from her because for 12 years, nobody could offer anything that was going to change her situation. For 12 years, she had been seeking and looking for this one. She tried this medicine. She tried this remedy. They, they poke her. They, they put the leeches on her. They suck the blood out. The Bible says that the life of the body is in the blood. So they're doing all kind of stuff and nothing worked. But she heard about this man named Jesus. The Bible says when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched him. Now hold up. I want you to imagine what the press is. Imagine again, you have hundreds and hundreds of people all coming to see what's going to happen when they get to Jairus' house. What's going to happen? Now imagine, you know, you got big old men that's right there. You might have, the, let's say, the, the, the linemen of the Saints football team. They all running behind Jesus, and they, they pressing up against him, and they keep hitting him, and Jesus is like, boy, back up. And, you know, and he, he just keep on going, and the people keep coming, and Jesus is like, man, y'all keep hitting me. And all kind of people are all around. You barely could even see the disciples. The ones that was close to him, you barely could see him because there was so many people that was pressing there. Now, this little woman, sick and weak, the Bible says when she heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind. She wasn't letting nothing stop her. 
Them big boys is right there. She's still trying to get through. She's trying to do her thing. And next thing you know, she's moving them out of the way because you know what? I got to get to him. I have no other, nothing else is going to go suffice. There's nothing else is going to heal me. I got to get to him and I'm not going to let anything deter me. How are you? With the things that you've been praying and believing God to fix for the last two, three weeks. Last two or three years, the last 12 years, you've been praying for that child. You've been praying for a job. You've been praying for, for, for something to break. Are, are you willing to, to do whatever it takes to get the blessing or to get the thing that you, you need from Jesus? Well, we come to church and sit in our synagogues every single Sunday and Tuesday and smile like everything is okay. Huh? Oh, praise God, my sister, I'm good. How you doing? Hi, <laughs> praise him. This woman didn't care about who was around her. She didn't care how she looked. She didn't care how she smelled. The Bible says when she heard of Jesus, came, when, she, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment because she had already determined in her heart. Her faith was so strong. It was so built up. Her belief system was, was so much right there. She said this here. She said, if I may touch but his clothes... I shall be made whole. I don't care what they say. I don't even care if he know. I'm telling you this here. I'm getting to him. Amen. And she began to push them big boys out the way. And them boys was probably hitting it with elbows, probably hitting it all up in her head. But she's still pressing it. I got to get to Jesus. If I could just touch him, I know what's going to happen to me. I don't care about what's going on around. I don't care if you get your blessing. I, I need mines. And sometimes, man, we're not just passionate that much about our blessings and the things that we, the, the ability that God, we don't pursue it. We'll start the first little obstacle come our way. What we do? We stop. Oh, well, I guess it just was, it wasn't God's will. Man, you don't even know God's will. You're not studying your Bible enough to even know that God says, man, you are the head and not the tail. Ask me for anything. If you believe, I'm going to give it. So what happens? And straightway, no, I'm sorry. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be made whole. And the Bible says, and straightway, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt it inside of her body that she was healed of that plague. Now just imagine the hustle and bustle of what's going on. Man, she didn't broke through. And she, mm, she grabbed me, she hurried up and let go. And she looked, the crowd is probably all the way 10, 12 feet away. She don't, it don't even matter now. She healed. She healed. But hold up, but hold up, something happened. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him. Now, I want you to imagine what's going on. All these people is around him. They're bumping up against Jesus, this little woman, then come and touch him. All of a sudden, time stops, and this dude is like, oh, oh. he don't even want to move no more. Because Jesus said, who touched my clothes? I don't think y'all understand what just happened. He said, she, Jesus said, he said, who touched my clothes? Everybody, hundreds of people are around him. Guess what? They was there just to see what's going to happen. All of them boys wasn't there touching Jesus. So many times we inside the church and we got everybody. Yeah, they show up every single day. They're faithful and showing up. But guess what? Are they being touched by Jesus or is Jesus touching them? No. All those people that was right there. It's like the energy of Jesus. Who touched my clothes? And the little lady, again, the crowd is probably already up ahead. There's no need to follow him now. She's already healed. The, the, the very thing she believed for is already done. But the effect, Jesus said, who touched my clothes? And, and he's looking around and them. Well, the disciples said, now come on now, Lord. Now, now, now you're really tripping. No, no, come on, man, you're tripping, man. You got hundreds of people around you, and you ask, who touched my clothes? Who touched your clothes? Who touched your clothes? Boy, I for so many times you wanted to drop that boy behind you because he kept hitting you in the back. But immediately in an instant, something happened because of her faith. When she touched Jesus, the virtue, the energy, the, the something that was inside of him, it left, and he felt that. Oh, because she believed. 
she began to explain to Jesus that, hey, it was me. I, 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 I just knew if I could just get to you. And, and she's trying to explain and she's trying to reason with him. And, and, and Jesus was not upset with her at all. In verse 34, as he said, and he said unto her daughter, thy faith made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. <laughs> right after that, Jesus performed, this is a major miracle, because everybody knew that woman was always sick. Soon as Jesus finished doing that miracle, where was Jesus on his way to? Where was he going? Come on, y'all, where we going? We, we, oh, Lord, I'm married out of time. He was going to Jairus' house, right? <laughs> While he yet spake, there came from, a, from the ruler of the synagogue's house a certain man which said, Hey, Jairus. Too late, man. And your daughter did, cuz. Your daughter is dead. Why thou troubles the master any further? Jesus has done so many miracles. Jairus was right there because he believed. He was right there. He was on, Jesus was on his way to his house. His daughter was going to be made whole. This was a little girl, 12 years old. Man, she was going to be all right because he trusted in Jesus. But right before, somebody else is like he took the blessing. They took the very thing that he needed, the healing that was needed. But I want you to, tell, I want, I want you to understand this here. Our Jesus, our God is not limited in any blessings. Just like he blessed one, he can bless another. Just like he blessed 10,000, he can still bless you. And immediately when Jesus heard that, look what the Bible says happened. And as soon as Jesus heard the words that were spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid. Say, my brother, don't fear. Don't fear. Fear going to cancel your faith, man. You already believed that I get, that's why you came and called me, right? Man, don't fear. Remember what he told the disciples? He said, man, don't be afraid. Look, the things that you're going to be, the, the things that God is going to be calling you to do, the things that you're going to be stepping out on faith, you can't be scared. You cannot be scared. You can't be afraid. You have to just go for it. God said this year, man, look, I'm going to order your steps. Great is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Everything that you want to do, the things that you want to pursue, guys, you have to go for it. Yeah. Amen. Don't be afraid. He says this here, only believe. Don't say what you see. Only believe. I don't care if things are looking down. I don't care if they said she's dead. Only believe. Don't be afraid. And look what happened. He says, only believe. And he suffered no man to come with him, save Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Now check this out. He getting ready to go to Jairus' house, right? The multitude is still coming. He told him, don't, don't fear. Man, we're going to see this. That girl dead. Now there's even, even more to see. He said, nah, I don't want none of y'all to come with me. He said, I need Peter, James, and John. And you know, James and John, he would call them boys the sons of thunder. Now, why was they in part of Jesus' inner circle? I still don't know. But the thing is, I really believe that their faith was so strong. At that point, when they lock up, it's like all heaven will shake when them three boys and Jesus begin to pray or begin to call in his name. Who are you hanging with? If you was in a situation, could you call Mary, Sally, and Jill to come with you to pray because your daughter is dying? If you can't, you got to you, you take inventory of your friends. Amen. Peter, James, John, and Jesus, they only way to Jairus' house. They tell everybody to stay back, get back. Because what's about to happen, this is grown folk stuff right here. You, 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 you're not mature. Enough. You, matter of fact, you don't even need to know what's going on. If you hear about it, that's good, but you're not going to be part of that. So they pull up to Jairus' house, right? Now I want you to hear what was going on. And he come into the house of the rule of the synagogue and see it a tumult. What is a tumult? Confusion all around. You got all, you got the aunts and the uncles there. You got, you got the cousins. You got the little sisters. You got all the family that's there. I mean, it's crazy over there. They, they hollering, they screaming. And all the child did. They, everybody is tore up. And he come into the house and he sees a tumult and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he said unto them, now listen to what is going on. I want you to imagine how would your family be if you just died or your child just died? If my daughter Mackenzie had just died, are we just going to be? Well, of course, I'm going to be get up in Jesus' name. If you die, I'm going to kill you. 
Well, no, she already did. But anyway, they, they're there, right? Imagine what the atmosphere was like, the environment was like. You got a dead child and they're 12-year-old that's dead. You got a whole bunch of unbelieving family members. What they saying? They crying, they tripping out, they, they want to get drunk, now they want to smoke, they want to get high, trying to ease the pain. Jesus walks up in there and they all cry and he said, what the heck is going on? That's not what he said. He said, why make ye this ado and weep? Listen to Jesus' words. The damsel is not dead, but asleep. Now they hollering and crying. <laughs> She's not dead, but asleep. Oh, <laughs> for real? Well, you tripping. Look at the very next verse. Now, if this don't seem like bipolar, I don't know what it means. Now, the 38, they were crying and hollering. Verse 40, and they laughed him to scorn, but when he had put them out, he took the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him, Jesus, uh, Peter, James, and John. And he entered the place where the damsel was. They put everybody outside. Get your uncle, get your mama, all of them. They ain't got no faith. They don't believe in God. It's not time to call a treater. It's not time to, to, to pray the rosary. It's not time for that. It's time for you to believe that your daughter will rise. And if you got the faith to believe, then you come in. If not, you need to get out. So he took the damsel by the hand and he said unto her, Talitha Kumi, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of 12. And they were astonished with great astonishment. And they charged them straightly, no man, they charged them straightly that no man should know it. And he commanded that something should be given her to eat. Jairus, his family believed, and his daughter was brought back to life. Yeah, y'all can clap for that. I'm closing it up. I'm wrapping it up, guys. This is it. This is the thing. All this stuff was going on all over Galilee. But when you went down to Jesus' hometown, the Bible says clearly, man, he couldn't do no great works there. He couldn't do no great works there. Save he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And when Jesus looked at those people and the Bible says that he marveled because we didn't get to it when he started to say, well, man, isn't, that, isn't, isn't he just the carpenter or isn't that Mary's son? Like, man, we grew up with him. I bought, I bought an old chair from that boy. You know, now you try to probably hate him or something. But they didn't know the transformation that had happened with Jesus himself. The very one that had everything that they need, they refused to put their trust in him. They tied God's hands so the blessings couldn't really flow because it wasn't nothing in Jesus' ability. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, Jesus had all the power. He could do anything that he wanted to do, but because of their faith and the lack of belief in him, he shut everything down. Brothers and sisters, let that not be you. God has called us for some great things. You have everything and every ability that is needed to do great things. Don't let nobody discount your, your, the power that God has put inside of you. Amen. Let's pray. Most high God, we just thank you right now and I give you glory, Father, for just hopefully, God, stirring up our faith and seeing every miracle and everything that you've done, Lord God. You told us that the works that you've done, greater works shall we do because you have to go to the Father. God, I pray now, Lord God, that everyone under the sound of my voice, Lord God, will not only be able to experience you at a level of, of, uh, of, of the supernatural, Father, but first off, God, I pray, Lord God, that anyone that's listening, God, that, that doesn't know you as Lord, that doesn't know you as Savior, Father, that they would repent to you today, God, that they would see that they're a sinner in need of a Savior, God. And I pray, Lord God, that they would ask you for forgiveness, Father. I pray, Lord God, that they would put their trust in you today. For all of us, Lord God, that has maybe been coming, Father. And we've been tying your hand, God, because of our unbelief. Daddy, I pray tonight that we would simply believe that our faith would increase today. God, that we would trust you with everything, Father. God, I pray that our tomorrow would be much brighter than today. God, I pray that as we go to sleep tonight, that the, the, the stories that happen, those accounts in your word, Lord God, would play constantly over and over in our mind that with whatever we're faced with on tomorrow and not so distant future, God, that we know that we can conquer it because of you. 
Father, I pray now for everyone, Lord God, that's maybe been looking to start that new business, God. Father, I pray, Lord God, that you would give them the faith to go with it. God, those that are on jobs, God, I pray for blessings and promotions to be upon them, God. Father, I pray, Lord God, for supernatural blessings to come upon them. God, checks in the mail, God, that when they go to their mailbox, Father, somebody forgot to mail them some money. Somebody, Father, God, let them have checks in the mail, Lord God. Father, I also pray, Lord God, for everyone here tonight, Lord God, that they have been with you, and your word tells us that you are a reward of those that, that diligently seek you. Father, they have been up in here for a couple hours, God. Father, I pray, Lord God, that as we leave this place, that, that we not leave your presence, God, that we would always recognize that your spirit is there with us, God. Father, I pray even now, Lord God, against every spirit of fear. Lord God, I pray, Lord God, we would not worry about anything. God, if it's healing that your, your people need, I speak healing on their bodies even now. God, if it's a financial breakthrough, God, I pray, Lord God, that the finances would be released. God, I pray, Lord God, if, it, if it's peace need to be in the homes, God, I speak peace in the name of Jesus. God, cover your people and let them know and let them be confident in knowing that you will never leave them nor forsake them. Father, we thank you for this time that we can spend with you. We thank you for your word. Bless us now as we go. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Brothers and sisters, man, thank you all so much. Y'all have a great rest of the evening. And look, don't limit it yourself. Don't limit God. Operate in faith and watch God do some miraculous things for you. Amen? Y'all have a good night. Be blessed.